Here's the interesting thing about today's movie. The life of an NPC, a non-player character, is categorized as boring, and it is boring. And it's an awakening story for our hero who realizes that there's more in life to going through the same boring routine every single day. But you know what? What if what if I told you that I would actually not be against being an NPC occasionally and just having a well-mapped out boring day? And like, I would play a game where I could go do something boring. And sometimes I do play games that are are actually boring, but, but I would, I would be all for being an NPC sometimes and just turning my brain off and letting my programming take over. So I might've just pitched you the sequel, Free Guy 2. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Okay, fine. I know I get bored after like five minutes of being an NPC, but you know what? It's not the worst thing to occasionally turn your brain off, but I had to keep my brain on for today's episode because we were talking to Zach Penn, the co-writer of Free Guy, and it was absolutely great to sit back down with Zach again. The last time he was in the screening series and podcast was for Ready Player One, which was another really fun episode. And you know, one of the interesting things about this episode is we actually recorded it on the day of Halloween. And I was thinking that I was going to get so much done that I was going to be able to get it up in time before the WGA vote even happened for the additional writing credit. And, uh, you know, it's the credit so that if you spent a week writing on the film, your name's now going to be in the credits. It was up for a vote the next day after Halloween. And I don't know what I was thinking. There was no chance I was going to get this episode up that fast. So spoiler alert, the additional writing credit vote passed the WGA, but I decided to leave in the discussion with Zach because it was an interesting discussion about what people were thinking before the vote passed and kind of a weighing of the pros and cons of whether or not it should pass. It did pass, as I just said. So I left that part in, even though the podcast is technically posting after the vote was decided in favor of the additional writing credit. Of course, time kept on ticking. There was no way I was going to get that posted when I thought I did. So I figured I'd save it for the holidays. And uh, I'm glad I did. You could still rent Free Guy online, uh, wherever you go to rent movies. It was a great chat, as always, with Zach. And he really went into the details of what it took to get this movie made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out today's sponsor, Coverfly.com. If you're a screenwriter who's looking to get their work out there, you should check out Coverfly.com as they curate the best talent discovery programs all in one place. At Coverfly.com, you could submit your script to fellowships, labs, competitions, and festivals, and track the status of your submission through the Coverfly Writer Dashboard. Also, they're an incredible resource for connecting industry professionals with emerging writers and hundreds of writers have actually met their agents and managers through coverfly.com and have gone on to work with top companies like Universal, CBS, Netflix, Amazon, and Blumhouse. So if you're an emerging writer with a finished screenplay, you should check out all the resources coverfly.com has to offer you. Of course, speaking of other cool things online, I hope you will check out Backstory Magazine over at backstory.net. We just published our new Dune issue, issue 45 and I am so proud of it. There is so much content in it and you're just going to love it. So the first thing I would suggest is you take a look at our table of contents over at backstory.net and then you can see what's inside. And uh, now would be the perfect time of year to support us as a subscriber. And you know, because it's the holidays, you could also give a gift subscription for Backstory for that important storyteller in your life. Just click the gift option at checkout and uh, you could assign a subscription to whoever you would like. Of course, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading the free issue over at Backstory.net or via our iPad app, Backstory. And uh, that should tell you if you want to become a subscriber. And if you do want to become a subscriber, aside from giving a gift subscription, if you're buying yourself one or for a gift, whatever, you could use discount coupon code SAVE Save five. That will save you five dollars off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. You have to use the code on our website, but your credentials will get you into the Backstory iPad app as well. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with co-writer Zach Penn about his latest film. Free guy. Okay, then, Zach, it's good to see you. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's good to see you, Jeff. It's been way too long. You're a kind, kind man to sit down and do this. I know that like you are in your 
ancillary run on on Free Guy. And so, you know, for for our listeners around the world, this has been something that we've been trying to do honestly since the film was in actual release and it just took forever. I yeah. I actually I think you know this. I was making a play with Disney to try and do an in-person Q&A screening because Free Guy's release was predicated on being in person only. So I was like, let's support that. I'll let's get an in-person Q&A screening for vaccinated only folks, show their cards at the doors, keep their masks on during the movie, like it'll be totally mellow. And and Disney was kind of interested, but I just couldn't get it off the ground. So I was I was thinking that I might have actually been able to. And so that's why we didn't do this earlier. And then I was waiting for it to hit on the different ancillaries. And then you and I were both getting busy and all good plans got shot to hell. But alas, here we are. It's on Blu-ray now. You could rent it on demand um, through the usual places that you rent movies, be it Apple, Amazon. And I think it's still on demand in most cable places. And um, I'm guessing it eventually hit Disney Plus, right? Per the agreement. Um, it's going to be the final resting place. It should be. I mean, it's gotten so complicated that I, uh, you know, I have no idea when it's coming out on different things. You know, f- obviously Disney bought Fox while we were doing Free Guy, which right. I was totally blindsided by. And I know a lot of people, obviously, who work at both places. So my head spinning and and plus with COVID, I just like, I wasn't even sure, you know, when it was actually coming out on Blu-ray. You know, right. someone told me, did you get it? Uh, I was like, no, actually, I think they have to send me a copy, but they they didn't. I think they now send a digital copy. In any so. Really? They don't send a physical copy? I don't know. I think they might be required to. Contract. Yeah, I think they're required to. It's a pretty petty. I mean, the, the guy, who, Steve Asbell, who's the president of Fox now, lives a few blocks away from me. He just said, come over to my house and I'll give you a copy. <laughs> Yeah. Fell out of the back of a truck. I get it. Well, so, yeah. you know, obviously the, the Fox Disney merger worked well for your movie and we will get into that in our spoilers section, but I want to just go back for a second. Cause speaking of in-person screenings, we kind of had a great one for ready player one. Uh, we had a fantastic in-person screening for ready player one with the sold out house. There was a few people turned away at the door. I don't like to turn away too many people, but it was a blast looking back since you've had a few years what was your biggest lesson on that one that, um, that kind of maybe affected your creative habits moving forward? My God, my biggest lesson. I mean, you know, working with Steven Spielberg for three years, it's pretty much 10 lessons a day, you know, in every possible aspect of filmmaking or, you know, I mean, even just watching him deal with having a large family and things like that was interesting. But uh, if it wasn't specifically him constant you know just doing things and i would say oh that's interesting why did you tell them to tilt the camera 10 degrees more and he said oh yeah well that i do that because psychologically if it's positioned here the way this character's speech will appear and i was like oh okay just getting that down 10 degrees um but and it was constantly like that how he uses light you know when to use a strobe effect um, just tons of stuff like that. But also everyone who works with Steven are all the absolute best in their departments. So if you're a screenwriter and you're curious, certainly the production of it was the most informative year of my life. I mean, I would learn more in that year than maybe I did in my whole career combined um, before it. So I mean, I I also remember interviewing you for Backstory Magazine about it, because not only did we do a screening and podcast, but we did this magazine article. There's always things that don't make it between the two, right, which keeps them separate. I think one of the interesting things you told me for the magazine article that was kind of an eye-opening moment was you said that you you were getting into a habit of occasionally writing an action scene and then a dialogue scene. And you said that Spielberg kind of pointed out to you, you know, you should try and combine the two. So that your your dialogue is hitting during the action. And I was like, you know, that's always kind of a, a good way to escalate dialogue. You can't do it every single time. But that was something that I remember was a really interesting lesson that you you kind yeah. of gleaned. Well, like one, that's absolutely true. You know, one thing I knew is a screenwriter who writes a lot of action scenes for over the years is that you have to have story in your action scenes. There's nothing more boring then you could have great action, but if nothing is really changing, if it's just 
two characters hitting each other. I mean, occasionally, you know, like they live, you'll get something so silly that it's amusing, uh, you know, a seven minute fight or whatever it is. But in general, you really have to plan carefully with your action scenes that you're not, it's not just a pure chase because the audience can take that for about a minute before they're like, okay, when's some story going to happen? Uh, which is, I, I really think you watch Steven's movies. That's a pretty cardinal rule of his. Like he's always focused on how is this action sequence or how is this dramatic sequence? What's the story turn in it? But you know, particularly on Ready Player One, there's a number of really dialogue heavy uh, scenes. And he just said, okay, look at all this dialogue and look at this sequence we have, you know, this dance sequence. And then there's a shootout and all this dialogue would just be more heightened if it was happening over, you know, it was much more, it was a more extreme version of something that I kind of knew intuitively and had done, but it was weird how much that made informed every scene. I started looking at every scene that was really dialogue heavy, which as you know, in ready player one, there there's a lot of stuff to say. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the movie is kind of, and the book is about saying stuff, you know, and literally stuff like recounting things or talking about stuff. So uh, yeah, it was a great lesson. And once I did that, everything in it weirdly felt more genuine, you know, because you know, if an actor is doing something that's, if they're in action, they're much less self-conscious of whatever they're saying, you know? So it, it lets the dialogue feel a lot more natural, even if it's the same dialogue. So, um, yeah, it was a great, I mean, there was a lesson like that almost, you know, daily. Which is awesome. And that translates to your other works. And, you know, speaking of your other works, for anybody watching this in the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, we can kind of see right behind you a whiteboard. And I believe there's some Beacon 23 stuff on it, your TV show that you've been working on. And that's why we're doing this today on Halloween. Uh, today is actually Halloween because during the week you, you've become so busy with your show. And I'm not trying to terrify you or haunt you on Halloween, but I want to go way back to the start because on on Free Guy, this is a rewrite. And at the beginning of your career on The Last Action Hero, and again, I'm not trying to traumatize you, you you were rewritten. Trauma. And we've uh, talked about this before because you're you're always really good to talk about it. And we, we've, we've definitely covered it. But I, I guess one way to look at it for Free Guy would be when you came on as a rewriter, um, because Matt Lieberman was the person who you know, the film grew out of his head and his concept initially. Yeah, his spec. I mean, his spec his script. Spec. And you were brought on. Talk about that that process of coming on, because sometimes it could be a very cold process where the person who's rewriting doesn't ever even contact the original writer. But sometimes I don't want to say it could be collaborative because that's not the point often of hiring a rewriter either. It is to bring in new blood, but there's a way to do it gentlemanly that I think that you've, you've gotten quite, quite good at. So tell us about that. Well, first of all, uh, you know, bringing up last action era, which to be fair, Shane Black talked to us a lot, you know, I had a writing partner at the time and he did talk to us a lot about what was going on. Um, which is good. And, and it was all very above board, but over the years, you know, I had experiences that were both frustrating from the standpoint of what was happening creatively to something I'd written, but also I knew the pain of, wait, I thought all this up and nobody wants to talk to me about it. Nobody even wants to get my two cents, which seems kind of nuts to me. Like if somebody thought this up, and, and kind of put it together well enough that all these great people got involved. And it's not like you're doing a page one rewrite, you know, which occasionally happens. Someone will give you something that's, it's one thing to, you know, someone bases a script on a, a concept or some IP and you're pretty much starting from scratch. That's one thing. But other than that, which is very rare, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want that person's insight? If it's bad, you don't have to listen to it. But second of all, particularly if you're the person they're hiring for the rewrite, nine times out of 10, you can afford to be gracious. You can afford to be a decent human being. I always tell people, you know, I think I've talked about this many times in the past. If I'm hired to rewrite someone, I call them. I make sure that somebody informed them 
I give them a chance. I'm like, you know, tell me, you know, complain. You could tell me you hate that I'm rewriting it. You can tell me you hate that I'm telling you about it. That's fine too. I've been there. You know, I don't want you thinking I'll listen to you. If you want to say, this is what I tried to do and no one listened to me, which is, you know, quite often the case that you'll find that you're doing stuff and then realizing, oh, the original writer had a scene just like this. And just over the course of development, it got eliminated. But all I try to do is tell the writers who I call do the same thing for other writers uh, when it, when it's, you know, when it's you. And there's been one or two times where that writer has gotten rehired and has called me to say, I just want you to know I'm paying you the courtesy. I know that you moved on. You only did two weeks, but I wanted to let you know they brought me back. And I was like, well, thank you. That's good to know. So I, I think it's a beneficial thing, uh, you know, regardless, because that person is going to have a lot of knowledge of what they've done. And why not? You know, I mean, one time someone got really angry at me. He misunderstood the context of my call. I, you know, no one had informed him. But even then, you know, two days later, I got an apology from him. And I, I kind of said, hey, look, I'm making money off of your creation. So, uh, you know, short of trying to kill me, like, you know, nothing you do is going to offend me in any way. That's yeah. maybe less than try to kill me. But. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, so obviously today's Halloween. On November 2nd, the WGA is going to a vote on the additional writing credit. I'm going to try and see if I could get this podcast posted before then and let people know that we talked about it. But I'm curious what your what your thoughts are on it, uh, you know, and, and I, and I'm not going to guarantee that I'm going to get it posted before then, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on it because I've heard both sides of the ar- argument. One is that it, it helps empower younger writers who get rewritten and otherwise wouldn't have their name associated with the project officially. Um, so it's kind of there for posterity. The other is that it could hurt younger writers who get rewritten when people see famous names in the additional writing credits, they will maybe misattribute some of the things that a younger writer put in there um, legitimately on their own that were great to the bigger known writer in the additional writing credits. The additional writing credits uh, has no financial value. So it's not something that adds to someone's, you know, residuals or anything like that, but I don't know. I'm, 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 it's, it's a toss up. I'm, I'm just curious where you fall on it because there's so many great arguments for both sides. Well, first of all, I've traditionally been against it because I thought for exactly that reason, I think that if you put big writers names at the end of the movie, it's definitely going to make people question who actually, I mean, that happens anyway. Sometimes it's hard to remind people, you no, know, the, the director and star did not write, the movie, although in, in this case of free guy, they did a lot of work on it. Um, you know, Ryan did a pass or two, I believe. Uh, but which is great. Cause I mean, he has a really authentic voice and I'm, I can't wait he's for him actually, to really, he's a very good writer. And yeah, so I would love to see him just have his own original screenplay too. One of these, I, I think he's been, he's worked on, he worked on this a lot and, and we're actually, well, we'll get into the sequel later, but yeah, yeah. Here's here's my feeling is that I'm mystified as to who's pushing this, because if I'm not pushing this and most of the other writers who, you know, are in similar career state as me, if we're not pushing it, who is? Because it's not going to help. I mean, I think it's a a terrible idea for a younger writer, just for the reasons you stated. Um, I mean, if it was retroactive, I would have so many awesome things on my resume that I could then talk about, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it if you rewrote it and didn't get credit. But um, so I see how it benefits me, but I really don't see how it's going to benefit anyone else other than overpaid writers like myself. Um, so that part is a mystery to me is why people are pushing so hard. I, I've heard the argument that it is, historically accurate. And I guess that's true. I certainly have been in the situation where I've done a tremendous amount of work on something and not even applied for credit, you know, because I felt the original writer deserved it. 
Um, and it is a bummer that your name is not it, but you know what? You can also get a producing credit if you've got leverage, you know? So if someone walked me through a bunch of instances where young writers who really did a ton of work and then just got pushed aside and it hurt their career that would be helped by being in the additional end credits, I've yet to have someone give me an example of that. So it's pretty hard for me to support it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, the other concept is somebody in craft service gets a credit in the end credits, but somebody who might've spent months writing doesn't. Now, mm. of course, the argument inversely is they might've spent months writing on a draft that was deemed by the producers to be bad and the, or the stars or the directors and was completely thrown out. So you're going to get some bad voices getting credit as well. But it, it, again, like I, I know of movies specifically that are original ideas, not based on previously existing IP, where the original writers through weird arbitrations have been knocked out of credit to the point that their name is nowhere to be found. People rewrote them and got credit. And because they were represented by managers, their manager actually ended up with a producing credit on the film, even though the original writer was not. So, I mean, like to me, I've always thought that the WGA's arbitration system needs an overhaul. And regardless of what happens with this vote, I think it still does. But that's a that's a whole other conversation. But I, I see you want to want to comment on that. Yeah, well, look, I've been in Last Action Year is the best example. I We wrote an original screenplay and lost screenplay credit on it. We, we had what the guild minimum is, which is shared story credit, um, which, you know, my agent and everyone else said that was one of the only times it's ever happened. And it hasn't happened a lot of times. I don't think it's happened much since then. So, which it really sucked. You know, I felt like, why can it say based on an original screenplay by I mean, this is something I actually think would be a good credit. If it's a novel, if it's a short story, you would say that's what it's based on. I think for original writers, particularly young writers, it doesn't matter if they're young, new writers, let's say, uh, the idea if you wrote an original screenplay that your name would appear nowhere seems unfair to me because if it said based on original screen, you know, based on original screenplay by and then written by, everyone would get they would understand exactly what happened. I wrote a screenplay for whatever reason, it was rewritten by other people who got the credit for writing it. But, you know, my status as a creator is still, you know, I'm getting as much more credit than the craft service person, which I think is fair if you've come up with it. Sure. When you're talking about based on IP, it's a little bit more complicated. I mean, I was, you know, to give you an example, um, there's a movie that came out this past year that uh, I was hired to write a draft of it. They needed a draft really fast. Um, and so they came to me saying, we know this is not enough time to write a screenplay, but could you do it? And I was like, it's funny. I've been thinking about how to write that screenplay. I can do it. It's not going to be great, but they needed it in like eight or nine days. And once I read the rewritten draft, you know, five other people rewrote it after me. And a couple of years later, it was made into a movie and I didn't apply for credit, nor did I think I deserved it. Cause you know, I was just, it was a comic book movie. So I was just basing it on, you know, some different storylines, but you know, I think that, I don't know. I, I, that's an unusual case. The one you describe, I think, uh, and by the way, their manager should deal with that, you know, should have given them a producing credit maybe, but like, you know, I think for the most part, I don't see how it doesn't overwhelmingly benefit someone like me. And I don't see why I deserve more benefit, you know, like, sure. I, I, I don't, I don't, I know what it was like to need protection from the arbitration process. And I don't need it anymore. You know, I, I can, you know, if I end up with no credit on something, so be it, you know, my, I'll keep going. It's not a big deal, but yeah. Um, I mean, look, I think there should be, it's fine. If someone came up with an exception for if you wrote the first draft, even if it's based on IP, you know, then something, I don't know what, but, but I don't necessarily think this is going to do it. And I do think it's going to lead to people, you know, 
I mean, it's going to lead to a lot of people suddenly having a ton of credits, some of whom maybe only did. Sometimes I'm hired to do a week or two of work on a script where, you know, I'm polishing one specific part of it and that's it. Right. So, well, I, I mean, like it also, you know, there's comedy roundtables. Sometimes they bring in a group of comedians for a couple of days to, yeah. to spitball jokes. It's not even clear if they would get credit or if it would apply to them I for think one of those you, sessions. I think if you're paid, I've been paid many times to do roundtables, you know, uh, I mean, I don't even, I can't even remember all of them because, you know, friends call you and ask you to do it. And it's, you know, they have to pay you for the day. Right. But sometimes you just are like, okay, I would have done this for free because it's really giving notes on a script to a friend. But yeah, I've been in those rooms where there's 12 people in it. And I don't know. I, it just seems like it's going to be weird if you get to an, you know, and, and again, I'm speaking out of school. I'm not sure that round tables count for this. It, it might just I, I be official think, drafts. I don't know why they wouldn't, because if you get paid to work on it, I think is the yeah. delineator. But on the other hand, I don't know. Maybe maybe if the credit is just really comes as just a list that tells you other it's the equivalent of putting them in the special thanks category, which you're not allowed to do. You know, you're not allowed to put a writer who worked on it in the special thanks section. Uh, I don't know. I mean, interesting. Well, I had to ask. I, it, no, be- you should. I mean, I have been in the middle of that. As you know, yeah. I've had so many cases on both sides where, um, where I've been the rewriter or, you know, the one who has rewritten and well, I've had, you know, so. We'll know in a day and, it, and it's not going to be retroactive. It'll be any, any credits, starting yeah, in 2022. So, you know, the, at least, at least they won't be going back through as much of the old stuff. Well, so tell me this, you know, when you start as a rewriter and obviously we're still in the non-spoiler section, what are some of the things that you do? Do you sometimes break it down and reverse engineer an outline and reverse engineer cards for it? What, uh, what's your yes. process of breaking down a script when you're a rewriter? Um, yeah, well, there's, here's, it's completely dependent on the project. You know, um, first of all, you know, I always, it it really depends on what's missing or what's not working, or frankly, maybe what notes some people have that aren't great notes, but there's a note behind the note that's worth doing. You know, I mean, a lot of times I've come in as a rewriter to try to convince the, you know, part of my job is convincing the people involved that some of the things are they don't like are actually working quite well. And I've never been, I know people who go through and try to change every little thing that they can. I feel like there's even a self-preservation aspect, which is I'd rather do what I'm there to do and, and be done sooner. And I can move on to something else than sit there and just not actually make uh, the script better for my own benefit. But there are people who do that. They just, try to rewrite everything. They change every name. They change all the other. Things. Right. You're, you're actually going back to the arbitration aspect in which um, people right. who could show presentation of new characters and, and specific characters that make it into the final movie get a special weight in their credit. And so, yes, you're right. There's some writers that come in that literally the first thing they do is change all the names so that their draft, should it survive, has more weight in an arbitration. So, yeah. Obviously, that's good that that's not your starting place. No, that but, is not. But so, so on free guy, yeah, tell us, tell us what happened when you yeah, came on. Let's say, as opposed to Ready Player One, where I knew the script that I was rewriting was something where they tried to do a low budget version of it, and I, you know, I knew Ernie Klein and was friends with them, and I said, "Look, I'm kind of going to start from scratch, but a lot of that means going back to what you had in the book." which, you know, and then, you know, we did talk about it all the time. Um, On Free Guy, it was much more of a, you know, I was called, they really wanted to make the movie. Sean and Ryan and Matt had worked on it a bunch together. And, you know, I, I, Sean called me up and said, I don't think you're going to want to do this because coming off Ready Player One, I think it's going to be really not interesting to you. And I read the script and I said, actually, this really isn't that much like Ready Player One. Uh, Yeah, it has some reference points that are the same, but 
this reminds me more of Last Action Hero or Elf or any number of movies, you know, where you have a fictional character who's kind of coming to life in a, in a you know, kind of semi-magical or science fiction way. And the structure of the movies are so different, you know, because Ready Player One sets up a sci-fi premise and then the characters are who they are and they go through very conventional arcs. I mean, I, I don't mean to denigrate it. I just mean they go through arcs that a person would go through. Guy, you know, even, you know, he gets, it gets compared to Truman show a lot, but Truman's a real person, you know, and guy isn't. So uh, one of the big, you know, for example, when I read that, I felt like one of the problems in the script was, and I, I don't feel bad about saying this because it wasn't, a problem generated by Matt Lieberman, which I would not want to go into, but there, Millie just wasn't a big enough character. And my argument was she's in a movie like this, where you have a fictional character, you know, where you have a character like Purple Rose of Cairo, great example too. Really that Millie is kind of the main character. Guy is the lead and the funniest and gets to do all the fun stuff. But Millie's the person who we're seeing the story through and she just came in way too late and there was too little of her. And so that's kind of where I started. And then that, you know, snowballed through the script in different ways, uh, which I think had happened just in development, you know, searching around for what the right balance was. So in that case, I did have to, I took the script, I only had two weeks, but I definitely had to re-outline it to make sure all the things that I was adding made sense and didn't screw up what was working, you know, in the script and what was working for the actor and what was working for the director. So that's a, it can be a very complicated process because, you know, you're like putting up the cards for the existing scenes and then trying to figure out exactly what changes, et cetera. Um, well, it, it was a really good change, you know, and, and, and I'm curious what Ryan thought of it, because obviously some actors would be intimidated with the concept of dueling protagonist or having it be really someone else's story per se. It is an awakening story for both, which we'll talk about more in the spoiler section. But what did what did Ryan think about that as a change when when you presented that? Uh, to his credit, the second I brought it up, he said, you're right. And that helps me play these scenes. You know, now that you're mentioning it, right, what I've been struggling with in these scenes is how to get my voice into it, but how to keep it clear. And, you know, when I pointed out to him, well, you know, some of the scenes that arose out of that led to some of his, you know, some really good moments for him. Uh, to his credit, Ryan is not someone who's like, well, no, 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 if it's not me saying it, then I don't care. He's very much focused on the story. I mean, I think, I think if he felt it would help the story, he would take himself out of more scenes if that was the case. So um, I have worked with actors who are not like that. I can tell you where they care about, if you even mention that they might not be the main character, which is a different thing, you know, the way in character, if you will, uh, they don't want to hear it. You know, they, I've had actors tell me they want to be the underdog, but also better than everyone else at everything. That's like, hilarious. Okay, well, that's not really possible. No, that's, Ryan that's really was funny. great. And, and, you know, a lot of times things that I suggested, you know, Ryan was the first one to say, that was my idea. It wasn't a good idea. Now I see why. And I'm going to run, you know, he'd call me or he'd send me an email saying, what if we did this, this, and this? And I was like, I'm just putting that right in the script because that's great. I mean, it's not surprising to hear that he's really good at coming up with, you know, great moments, not just for himself, for other actors. Um, and he's also good at story. I mean, he, one of my favorite lines in the movie that would spoil it uh, is a line that Ryan came up with. I think he's talked about it publicly and credit where it's due. When I heard it, I think Sean called me to read me the line. He said, this is what Ryan came up with. What do you think of that? And I was like, that's awesome that, some that I'm going to get credit for it or Matt will get credit for that line. Tell Ryan, thank you, because that is a great idea. It wasn't just a line. It's like an idea. Um, so, you know, it was, I also think 
they all really liked it. They all really wanted to make the movie. There was so much momentum to make it, but they were all, you know, Ryan and Sean particularly were feeling like something is off, like something isn't quite working. And, and uh, you know, I think that's where I do a good job. You know, I'm a really good script reader. Um, you know, like I did that for a year at the beginning of my career, but like, I am good at analyzing a script. So uh, who'd you, who'd you read for? I read for Quincy Jones entertainment. I read for Stacy Scher at, um, at what was at Jersey films back, back right. in the day. Um, when I was, when I was in college, I, I did, uh, I was a reader for Joel Silver and then Scott Rudin briefly for a while after that. So Yes, I, I understand the, the good values of, of reading scripts and writing coverage in a fast way and being able to analyze them. I and mean, I think it's a good skill to have. Well, so you By the just, way, I wasn't so good at it back when I did it. It was only the first, you know, we sold last action year a year out of college. And I realized later how bad I was at it in terms of, you know, because if you've just started, you don't really get what people want to know about a script as a script reader. I'm just saying that over the years, I've gotten real, I think I've gotten good, you know, uh, and I will, I'm constantly telling people I'm not such a great writer and they're like, Oh yes, you are. I'm like, no, no, really. Like I, you know, I've written like Mike white is a great writer who, you know, writes wonderful dialogue. And when we wrote together, he would write stuff. And I just like, that's great. And I'm pretty good at a lot of things, but the thing I am good at, I think is being able to look at a script it's a little bit more of analysis than it is just writing. You know what I mean? It's figuring out, okay, well, look, what type of story are you telling here? What is this about? You know, like what genre is it? You'd be surprised how many times I get hired to rewrite something. And I'll say, well, what, what genre, is this a horror movie or is it an action movie? And they'll say, you know, action movie. I'm like, do you do realize that all the main sequences are horror sequence? There's suspense and horror sequences or the opposite is quite often the case where they say it's a horror movie, but it really isn't that horrifying, you know? So, uh, you know, that's often one of the first things that you kind of have to snap people out of. Like you think you're making this, but that's not what your screenplay is. And that's not even what your idea is. You know, you said you came on and you had two weeks to kind of retcon the outline, but how long were you on, on free guy total? Well, I don't know about total. It, the original deal was I only had two weeks free. So I said, I think I can do these notes in two weeks and I didn't have to rewrite the whole script. That was part of it. You know, there's a, a lot of it. I just didn't touch. Um, then after the first two weeks and even in part, part of those first two weeks, was Sean and me and my assistant at the time, Danny, uh, who was actually has a cameo in the film. Uh, we were all in my home office and the more I was working on it, the more into it I was getting. And so then when they said, Oh, will you do another week? I was like, sure. And then when they said, well, what if we had you do two more weeks later? And I was like, yeah, and now I'm really committed. And then once the cast started rounding out, I was like, yeah, whatever you want me to do, just call me. So uh, I think I ended up making an all services deal, which is something I do on occasion. I did it on Ready Player One also, which is as a, as a writer who's in a position to, you know, of relative power, although as a screenwriter, it's always limited. You know, you really shouldn't ever do free work. You know, if you do free work, then everyone else is, and, you know, meaning, if the studio says, yeah, we know you're done with it or anyone, the director says, we know your time's up, but like, would you just do this one quick thing for us? Well, technically that's free work and you're setting a bad precedent for people who can't afford to just do another couple of weeks on a movie. So sometimes I just tell people, let's make an all services deal. I, I won't gouge you for it. Just pay me some lump sum and you can call me whenever you want or however you want to do it. And you'd be surprised how often people are like, what's your angle? I'm like, no angle. I'm, I know if Steven Spielberg calls me, I'm going to do the work. So I might as well just acknowledge it now and not try to renegotiate with you guys every three weeks. So that makes, yeah. that, that makes sense. What, what were some of the things that you learned about Sean Levy's habits, his creative habits? And how important was it for you to be 
working with effects sequences or storyboard artists, or was it really more just kind of character and narrative drive? Obviously, we're going to get into the the nitty gritty of it in the, in the spoiler section, but going back to the beginning of my question before I lopped in another one by accident, working with Sean Levy and, and, and the things that you gleaned about his creative habits. Well, first of all, I knew Sean before this, you know, uh, I had met, you know, I, we were, had a lot of mutual friends and I'd seen him a bunch of times and hung out with him. Um, and I knew his work and we'd almost worked together a couple of times before. So, uh, that wasn't surprising. Um, what is always great is to see how good someone is with story when you're in the room with them, because there's plenty of directors who are not good with story and Sean, you know, it's, he sometimes will be very against something, but he'll kind of say to you, it might just be me. I might just being, maybe I'm being dense, but this is what I think. And the good thing about Sean is half the time he's right. And the other half of the time, he's not the slightest bit offended when you're like, well, let me take you through it. He'll end up being the biggest supporter of that idea or that fix. But, um, you know, a lot of the work that we had to do, you know, there were effect sequences and boards that have been done. And I, that's something I've done a ton of in my career. I mean, I love working with board artists. Like, you know, I ended up becoming good friends with board artists and, you know, taking them on to the next project or introducing, you know, one of my friends ended up working for Marvel for, uh, I brought him in on a project and he ended up being their main guy for like 10 years. So that's great. Uh, and I just come off ready player one, which was the single best, you know, you're talking about effects, you know, it's ILM and digital domain on the phone or in person with you every single day talking about the effects and then hearing Steven Spielberg give notes on them. So with Sean, it was pretty clear immediately that he totally knew what he was doing and he could sense that I knew what I was doing. So it just became a very easy process. Like he would say, I really want to preserve this. I'd be like, I get it. So let's set that up here because I understand that's the effect. It's, you know, the effect shot you're looking for is this. So uh, I won't mess with that, but you know, it's always a blast. You know, Sean is a very positive person. Like I, you know, he's very, he's got a lot of energy, like, in a, and I don't mean like he's hyperactive. I mean, he has does a tremendous amount of work all day long and like Spielberg, I don't know if anyone can match up to Steven for this, but they both are able to work on something and then watch a cut of something and then give notes on something. So, you know, just his work ethic is excellent. So um, I think I told you on Ready Player One, I kind of got swept up into Steven's work ethic where normally, you know, when I get a job, I'm like, can I take like a week off before it, you know, I just think to myself, I've got like six weeks. So why don't I spend the first week playing video games, you know, and I stopped doing that, but you really stop doing that when you work for Steven, because you get used to writing every day, you know? So, well, I guess that brings me to my next question. When, when you're on one of these rewrite gigs specifically, there isn't a lot of time for procrastination because sometimes you really are on a limited contract. So how do you motivate yourself to, I know it sounds silly, but honest to God, not procrastinate and meet your deadlines and get through the rewrite that you need. Is it, is it, I've heard some writers liken it to, since it's not really your baby, right? Since it's not your original idea, getting in there and, and making the tough cuts and inventing some of the bridges to put things together is psychologically a little different and easier because it specifically didn't originate from you. But I'd be curious to hear your your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's true in that it's always harder to see the problems in your own work or even the good things. Like that's another problem is often it all seems boring to you because you've been working on it for so long. So you do a little bit of distance does help. But honestly, for me, when someone hires me on a weekly, I just, I still feel like this is a lot of money they're paying me. This is, I, I should be grateful, you know, granted, if I do a good job, they're grateful to me, 
it, it's a much more even relationship than, you know, any other type of writing you do as a screenwriter, because when you're brought in to do a high pressure production rewrite, people are really nice to you and really, you know, they're, everybody is very complimentary. You know, it's very different than typical screenwriting experience. And I have to be honest that even now, you know, however many years in my career, I just feel like they're paying me a lot of money. They, I got to do anything I can for them this week. And so it's much easier to motivate when you know this week's going to be tough. I need to sit down immediately after getting off the phone and work on it. And I'm going to have to work my ass off on it for a week or two weeks. What's for me, what keeps me motivated is I just feel like I've just committed to this. I got to give it a hundred percent. I can't be one of those people who phones it in and because I have that attitude and I know the light is at the end of a short tunnel, it does force me to write really quickly. It's much harder when the due date is 12 weeks away or six months away, uh, then it gets much harder to be, you know, uh, that intense about it. But I still feel like. Yeah. Right. Writers, writers having a good tough deadline sometimes brings the, them able to, to kind of muster up that, that, that power to, to power through it. Right. Also, I feel like it's a little bit being like a high paid closer in baseball. It's, sure. They hired you, they need you for one or two innings and you owe it to them to, you know, like if you don't do a good job, then what are you, you know, your job is to come in and fix things under pressure. So that's always a motivating factor for me in these short jobs. I kind of like that it turned into a longer job week by week because that kept me in that same mindset of it's just one more week. Got to give them my all, you know, did, um, did it extend into production? Yeah, it did. I how, mean, how, how far into production did you go through all production? Yeah. I mean, Sean, uh, I was only on set for a brief period, I'd say for a week. Um, I think he kind of likes to do his own thing. I mean, he was calling me all the time, right. so pretty busy. But yeah, I mean, we were working on the script in post. We were working on this, you know. So they so they did another all services thing for you, but it but it started as a two week commitment. Yeah, but it did evolve into you know regular deals like before you know another couple of weeks and then this and then that and then eventually I was just like the script is in good shape. They're going to call me, you know, if Taika comes up with a great ad lib. Right. And they need someone to carry it through. What I mean, that's that's fun. Like that's a bonus. I mean, if you aren't excited to like take something that's really funny that came up out of set, you know, and spin out a page of dialogue about it, then I don't know why you're writing. No, of like, course. So hey, per, gets- per what you were saying earlier with, you know, sometimes people not understanding the good things in their scripts. I think the most famous example I've seen would be Napoleon Dynamite. In which, you know, honestly, just a fantastic comedy. But during editing, the director was just getting so sick of it because he knew all the jokes, even though he wrote the script, that he didn't he didn't think it was ready. And the producers submitted it to Sundance without him knowing because he said he did not want to submit it to Sundance and wanted more time on it. And they're like, it is freaking ready. And of course, you know, he later admitted that they were right. And he just like he was too two in it. Well, so, all right, last question, non-spoilers. Do you happen to know anything on the budget or the schedule, even just a range? Obviously uh, you would have a better clue of the schedule. I don't think I would be allowed to tell you the budget if I knew it. I okay. definitely know the range it's in. I think it's re- what's been reported seems accurate to me, but okay. you never, you don't get to see the real budget on a well, studio film unless, right. you know, um, Sean gets to see it, but they don't really show it to me. Um, and the schedule, I forget exactly how many days it was. Um, uh, I mean, I have the product, you know, I have like uh, a call sheet that would probably tell me, but. Okay. You know, Fair I enough. No like big deal. It, yeah. It, I feel like it was, it was definitely a longer schedule than Ready Player One, which was ridiculously short for a movie of that size. Uh, but it wasn't like X-Men level schedule where, you know. Uh, the end, you never know when the end is going to come. Right. Um, so it, it was a very, you know, Sean runs a very tight ship and and so does Ryan, I guess. I mean, they're really, 
you know, like he, Ryan's been telling the story about getting Chris Evans in the Sean shot him out in 15 minutes, you know, for that cameo, which might seem to people like big deal. All you have to do is come in and say something, right? This is a spoiler. It's not a spoiler anymore. Everyone. I mean, we'll get to it in the spoilers, but yeah, he shot him out in 15 minutes. Chris Evans is in the movie. Uh, but you'd be surprised. I mean, you know, on a movie set, even shooting something that short usually takes three hours of your time because they need you there early and whatever, but they run very fast. And, you know, Sean gets a lot done quickly. Um, Post, you know, he's much more meticulous in post. He's really tweaked the movie a lot. And then the pandemic helped him tweak the movie more and more. We are going to get into the spoilers then. So podcast listeners in iTunes and Spotify and YouTube viewers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where the videos of these things go. If you have not yet seen Free Guy, press pause, go see it. You can find it anywhere you can rent it. It's out on Blu-ray. Come back because we are talking about the spoilers. So so getting into it, you know, what were some of the interesting notes? And, and it's always hard for writers to take notes. And sometimes as a rewriter, especially when you're coming in, you could be coming into a battle between a director and a studio or you right. don't know where the, the right way for the river to flow is. So it can be a dangerous situation to come into. I know that's not what happened here, obviously, but, but tell us about the importance of being able to take notes and interpret notes. Well, first of all, I actually think knowing where the bodies lay is one of the reasons you call the original writer, like knowing whose ideas were what and who feels, you know, has ownership over different things and what people like often the person, the original, not the, not necessarily the original writer, but anyone who's worked on it before you, that's a good place to find out. This is what people's intentions are. And -and so-and-so doesn't like this and they don't like that. So, uh, but that is a very important part of the job. Who's really being the impediment to making the changes that seem like they should be made, you know, and often if I don't agree with the director uh, about the changes, I often just don't take the job because I don't want to be undermining some director by doing the studio's notes. In this case, first of all, you know, when you're working under this much pressure, the notes are pretty scarce. I mean, they're, they're very, I mean, there were some good notes, but I'm just saying often you know, you're giving a scene to Ryan and he's pitching back stuff that's great. And, you know, you're also making sure to fit with the production plan. So it's almost more about the original document you send. You know, like I usually just say, here's my stream of consciousness thoughts about what we need to do. And then people will say, well, no, 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 you can't cut that. You can't cut this. And I'll say, then you should hire someone else. Cause I don't, I don't think we can do this unless we make these changes. Interesting. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think like what some of the... Yeah, if you have an eye-opening note that you remember. You know, it was such a, it was such an intense, you know, couple of weeks, the beginning of it, that I don't remember, uh, you know, I don't remember like any really specific ones. I mean, I really have to rack my brain for it about That's it. That's cool. I, I think it's more, there were things in the script that I suggested were not needed, like there was this young girl, this character who's, uh, you know, was like a little girl who's a character in inside the world of the game that I just felt like, yeah, this is some really funny stuff. A lot of it was sounded very much like Ryan Adlib, I think it was. But I just was like, this is not on story. We're not going to have room for it. We should cut it, you know. And uh, I think people were very worried about some of the AI stuff that I was proposing. You know, I said like, we have to do more service to what is the truth about Guy? Like, how do we explain what's happening to him? And there was a lot of confusion when I said, you know, Keys is going to describe exactly how what's happened to Guy. Even on the page, it seemed to people that it was just, you know, people were never going to understand what Keys was saying. And by the way, Joe Keery deserves a lot of credit. I've told him this he took these heavy exposition scenes and made them seem emotional so that when he's, you know, part of it is setting up the scene correctly. If he's bursting into Millie's apartment 
to tell her that she was right, look what he's discovered. And, and they're kind of at odds at that point. That's a much better way to get out the exposition about what's happening to Guy than if you do two characters sitting there saying, wow, this AI is really growing. Yeah, look at the screen where it shows you all the things that's happening to him. That's amazing. Oh, is that like that other AI? Yes, it is. Well, that's obviously a lot of movies end up doing shit like that. And uh, on this, we worked hard to, to do that. But some of that AI stuff was definitely kind of hard to explain why I thought it was important because I felt like we needed it not for Guy. We needed it for Millie and Keys. You know, they needed exposition is really tough. And at the end of the day, I mean, again, even a lesson of Queen's Gambit where they're talking in highfalutin chess terms, I could easily have seen there being a debate that no audience member is going to understand it. But because the actors understood it, just like what you just said, and, you know, the the emotional resonance that Keys was able to give it, obviously, it it translated well to the screen and it, it makes the movie a little more intelligent by making a little more sense of the character and, and how he could, you know, even the concept of having memories, I remember, was one of kind of the bigger things, you know, after after he was erased the first time, but he's he's kind of still had some part of his past that he just needed to be reminded of. So yeah, you know, to give credit, um, the Mike Micah, who is a game developer and historian who is in my documentary, Atari Game Over, then worked on Ready Player One as an advisor. And then I brought him in to work on Free Guy. Um, He was our, you know, became the consultant on the show. And some of the ideas were things that I talked out with him. And I was like, tell me what the actual, what the truth is in terms of how a game would work this way. And uh, he became really crucial. And at times, I think there was some resistance to will all this stuff play. But, you know, when I, you know, one scene that I don't, that's not really a kind of scene that I normally write, but the scene where Buddy and Guy, where they talk about, you know, Guy says, you know, what if I told you, you know, the world, you know, nothing was real. And Buddy says, well, I don't know about all that. You know, after a few misdirects, um, my, and one of my favorite go-to things, which is talking about ghosts, you know, um, where he's like, what is it, what's the ghost wearing? Um, if you've ever seen the grand, I have a whole riff on that. Like why do ghosts appear in their best outfit instead of like the decayed suit they were wearing or whatever. Right. Um, and who picks what age they are. But anyway, um, that scene where he says, all I know is right now it's, you know, two people who care about each other, trying to help each other. So even if this isn't real, this moment's real, right? I mean, it's happening. So it's real. And that's, you know, an idea about, you know, the experience of reality that I think is a pretty interesting idea. I was really psyched that people caught it. Like I got a, all sorts of tweets and people mentioning it that, you know, this idea of, cause it almost seems sappy, you know, the scene almost seems like, Hey, I'm just a friend helping another friend. Right. But it's actually speaking to a much bigger question, which is, you know, it's not a question of whether guy knows he's real. How do you know you're real? Like what, what guarantees you that your experience is real? It's just the feeling that it's actually happening. So anyway, uh, you know, there are things like that, that, you know, right. Cause he's in the moment. He also at one point says, you know, I just enjoy having a beer with my friend. Yeah. And so, so I mean, like, it's that, it's that same thing of, even if, even if this isn't completely real, I'm enjoying this particular moment. Right. Whether or not it's or, disrupted, which I'm, is right. definitely high fluid. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, Buddy is a good character to deliver that info because he doesn't understand what Guy is talking about. So he's responding in a very real way, which is he thinks about it and says, well, I don't know anything about what's real and what's not. I just know what I'm doing right now. And that's actually what helps him see something that Guy can't see at that moment because, you know, he's been bowled over by these much larger revelations, which is that he's not real, you know, whereas but he isn't thinking about any of that. So, I, I mean, it's, it's good for an awakening story because this is an awakening story where obviously just getting the glasses, right. is kind of the inciting incident in which he's able to finally see this real world. And then meeting Millie obviously is the, is the next thing that, that kind of 
pulls back the layer. Ooh, hey, I'm just reminding you really quick to check out Backstory Magazine. We just published our brand new issue, our winter issue, Dune. And it is amazing. There is so much great content in there. I cannot wait for you to see it. I hope you will check out the table of contents over at Backstory.net to see what's inside. And you know, this is the holiday season. So if you want to gift somebody a subscription, you could give a gift subscription by going to Backstory.net. Just check in that gift box at checkout for the important storyteller in your life. If you've never read us before and you're considering subscribing, you know, you could read the free issue over at Backstory.net or via our iPad app Backstory. And if that doesn't convince you that you want to become a subscriber, what about I sweeten the deal with a discount coupon code SAVE5 that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory and all the stuff we published in the last few years of our archive. So there's a lot of reasons to subscribe, but I really hope my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page will consider becoming subscribers to support my passion project So thanks for considering. Of course, hats off to today's sponsor of Coverfly. Make sure to check out their website, coverfly.com, to see how they could help you get your script out there. Of course, they're also an incredible resource for connecting screenwriters with industry professionals, and hundreds of screenwriters have already met their agents and managers at Coverfly and gone on to work for companies like Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. If you're an emerging writer with a finished screenplay, make sure to check out Coverfly.com to see what resources work for you. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our chat with co-writer Zach Penn about his latest film, Free Guy. Tell us how your action scenes look on the page. Because, I mean, obviously you're talking about collaborating with visual effects people. And, you know, we talked about this a little in Ready Player One as well, but there's the impetus to not overwrite right because you're not the director and you want to give enough for the crew heads to be able to understand the job at hand for the scene so it's kind of a delicate balance some writers like to do it like kind of haiku and have a lot a lot of white space so you could just focus on specific moments that'll be fleshed out what are are some of the tips and tricks that have worked for you for writing action well first of all when i was younger when I was writing Last Action Hero and for quite a few years after that, I thought it, part of our job was to think up all the gags and the stunts. So, and, you know, we came up with some good ones, but we really, I really tried to write out action sequences the way I saw them edited together in my head, which is really a waste of time because occasionally you write something and it really lays out well, but as you said, it's a collaboration. Uh, once you meet, you know, a stunt coordinator or a first AD or, you know, some second unit director and they come up with something much better than what you had and the visual effects people come up with something much more astonishing looking than, you know, they take a different approach to it or a storyboard artist does, you start to realize I'm knocking myself out here over something that is not gonna translate, you know, well, it's just not going to translate because it's too specific. It's not leaving room for people to, you know, figure out what's actually going to work. So as I've, you know, as I've gone on in my career, I've become much more willing to write, here's what's going to happen in this scene. Here's what we're going to see, you know, like in general, we're going to see this kind of action sequence. And there's a couple of big moments like this and this, And, you know, I'll write it out more than this, but I will be unafraid to summarize within the script as long as the story beats are clear. That is the thing you can't, you have to explain to them how the story beats work into the action. I mean, right. I mean, especially here, you know, you have characters walking down the street delivering sometimes expository dialogue and there's robberies going on behind them and things exploding and it's and it's really wild so i mean a lot of this, that this is, is an extreme example here's the thing a lot of that is sean and the effects people and everyone on set um i mean which i saw instantly that he was going to figure as long as i suggested which matt already had in the script that there's constantly stuff happening in the background it's you can throw some ideas out but you're better off giving those ideas directly to the people doing it than getting really tedious in the script with like exactly what all those gags look like. 
because particularly in a movie like this, those gags are, are, you know, they're split second gags and they don't deserve four sentences of description, you know? Right. So you only put in the ones like the man on fire, you know, who he puts out, you have to yeah. describe the man on fire and then describe putting him out. Right. But, right. But like the sequence where a guy interrupts the people jacking the car and tries it over and over again, that was, there was some version of that in the script, but the stunt people, you know, the stunt coordinator, I think, came up with the action of it. And then Sean and other people like expanded it. And, you know, because you wouldn't want to write all those beats, you know, this time he grabs the shotgun, but she pulls out a gun and shoots him anyway, while the other guy flips over the car. You know what I mean? It's just, you just want to see guy learns how to beat, you know, the players at their own game or whatever it is. You know? in, a, in a film like this, you have, you know, the importance of having a legitimate antagonist. And obviously in an action movie, the antagonist usually seems to be somebody that is powerful, right? It's like they, they have destructive powers, you know, a super villain, stuff like that. But Antoine here is just, you know, a, a CEO bro type of guy who we learn ripped off their code. And has the power of the universe per se, because he's going to do the reboot and try and erase guy. But tell us about the challenges of an antagonist like that, because it was something that took me a little while to get used to, in which there's so many physical threats in the world that are just typical video game threats, which are fun, that it was interesting to realize that, you know, it's not like Antoine is a, is a big physical threat until maybe when he grabs the axe. And he's going to start cutting up the servers. That's about it. Right. And even that, I would say in the script, you know, was less emphasized as he was particularly, um, you know, it wasn't like we're trying to set up the threat that he might ax Millie. Um, uh, right. No, actually, one of the things I like about the movie, um, which, you know, if you think about like Elf, and to a certain extent, Last Action Hero, I mean, the movie ended up developing a very, you know, villainous characters, but like, they're not, it's not like Lethal Weapon, where you need a big bad guy, or Bond, where you need a big bad guy with a plan that you're trying to stop. Uh, in this movie, what's nice about it is, it's just as much about guys' competition with the world, you know, with the state of the world, as it is, you know, Antoine is a complicating factor in that. And actually one of the things I think Taika did an extremely good job of, I mean, Antoine always was very jokey and got jokier and jokier. And, you know, just cause it was easy to, you know, write jokes for him. When Taika came in, of course, everyone talks about his ad libs, which are great. I mean, he's a fantastic ad libber. But he also plays a couple of scenes, the scene with um, Keys, where he's kind of like, you know, he kind of admits what he's done. He's also clearly has some affection for him, you know, that he's not truly a villain. And frankly, he's even kind of telling Millie at the end, why are you doing this? Take the money, like the money, right. you know, there's no advantage to this. Um, so I actually like that because I find that, a lot of times, particularly when you work on Marvel movies, you know, or things like Marvel movies, you have to come up with a big bad guy who's doing something that almost invariably seems stupid. Like it's very hard to come up with a villain plot uh, in a big, big movie that isn't on the face of it. It isn't something that would crumble once you really examine it. Like, you know, my favorite example is the fifth element where you know, Gary Oldman's plan is to, he's going to get all this money and in exchange, they're going to destroy the universe. And you're like, well, what are you going to do with the money when the exactly. universe is destroyed? Um, but I think with Free Guy, that was really one of the more helpful things because it forced you, we still had to come up with what are the things that could happen that Antoine could do that could make things more difficult for Guy and Millie, Right without it being silly. Like, you know, we, these are not people who are going to get in a fist fight, you know? So a lot of it is you actually fall back on suspense. You know, you fall back on, 
Keys is doing something and it's only a matter of time before they find him. Or, you know, Guy is doing something which the stakes we know are not life and death for us, but they are for his character and therefore for whatever Millie and Keys are after. So um, I think it leads to a more, usually a more organic feeling script. You know, um, you know, look, it's all, there are certain characters. I always say like Magneto is great to write for because he always seems, his plans always seem pretty justified. You know, um, he's not like a true uh, Bond villain. He's got a very strong point of view and a reasonable attitude towards things. It's just his methods are bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's one of the advantages of having a story that's about, about a character coming to life. You know, even in Last Action Hero, the villains in our script were, you know, and the final movie, they're very cartoony, you know, they're, they're of the world that they're from. So, you know, you kind of are laughing at them at the same time that you're, you know, supposed to be scared by them. Um, it, it's but. fascinating here because, you know, with the villain's plan of kind of erasing the world, right. And they're, they're racing the clock. You have a ticking clock. They need to recover the stuff from the warehouse and you, you want to keep guys safe. It, it gets interesting when the reset happens though. And he doesn't remember himself because, you know, some movies that would be their, their end of the movie is, can they stop it before the rewrite happens? But that, it seems like you're what second act to third act turning point. If I was yeah, no, in the second act, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. so, I mean, it's, it's interesting and it was, it was kind of refreshing. I'm like, Oh wow. So they, they lost that battle that you're waiting for them to win. And you're wondering what's going to happen now. And you get into this concept of sparking a memory in him because he is a special AI that was able to survive a rewrite, uh, you know, an overwrite. Um, and you, you kind of get into this, well, where are they going to go now? And you don't always get that in movies. You know what I mean? And, and it was, it was fun to see that. Yeah. So, it's very, it's true. Uh, thank you. And you know what, it's pretty hard to come up with a concept that lends itself to those types of escalating twists. Uh, Mike, Micah was very helpful in terms of the reboot. You know, he talked about how it still wouldn't clear out what essentially is guy's code. It's still in there, you know, because it's, a, I guess, I don't know, I'm going to use the wrong term, but I guess it's kind of a soft, you know, reboot. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, like w- one of the things that's very interesting about the structure of the script that is in Matt's, you know, it's why Matt sold his spec is that one thing that worked really well is the idea that the more alive you realize Guy was, the more the stakes of him surviving took over from will we win our lawsuit, which is not, right. you know, which is good for personal scenes and helps explain characters' motivations, but it's not a movie about lawsuits, you know? So um, that's one of the really nice things. Most movies cannot, it's too hard to come up with three full acts of conflict between the hero and the antagonist. And so they just vamp. And so you get scenes that you're like, okay, I know none of this is going to happen and they're going to have another fight later over the same thing. But in this movie, because it's also driven by this voyage of discovery, if you will, you've got ways that you don't have to escalate the stakes quite so quickly. So you can start adding more and more obstacles you know, right when you think, well, where can they go from here? Well, the answer is we've saved a lot of stuff. I mean, some of those twists used to happen earlier and, and, you know, we basically kept figuring out ways to say, well, no, let's just go halfway because we don't know what's going to happen to the guy. So, you know, well, again, in a world where people could get blown up and then be regenerated like a video game world, again, it's, it's the mental threat versus the physical threat. So him losing his consciousness really became the the risk to his character um you know structure wise managing what's going on in the video game and the real world seems like there was a trick to it as well how did you kind of graph that out if you did for whatever was necessary in your rewrite because you want to serve as both and it's kind of a juggling act yeah well first of all in that sense ready player one was informative of course Stephen and I, you know, were like, it was giving us fits, 
trying to figure out exactly where people were in the van while this was happening in the Oasis. And, you know, it was very, very complicated. It's easily the most complicated movie I've ever worked on. Um, I think Steven said the same thing. Um, with this, partly coming off that, I kept thinking to myself, let's keep it simple because these characters don't belong in car. There's not people with weapons chasing them. So none of that's going to work. Uh, Sean and, and Ryan and whoever else deserve a lot of credit. They started weaving in more and more stuff of people in the real world doing things. Uh, I mean, a lot of that came during the course of production and the more Sean saw it working in post, the more he added of it. And I think it's really, it's actually very important to the movie, the whole seeing real people talk about Guy and talking about their feelings about him and talking about NPCs. I mean, all that really blossomed into something in a very organic way. But, you know, mostly you just have to, you have to figure out what is, you know, what can my characters believably do in this context in the real world? And therefore, how do I, what's worth cutting back to, you know, like, what is it? That's the juggling act is the video game world's always going to be more exciting. So how do we make what's happening in the real world, you know, worth watching? And I will say, and this was quite an organic thing between me and Ryan and Sean, I'd say is, the whole love plot between, um, you know, Joe and Jody, we, first of all, we kind of grew into it more and more. Um, and it was partly, you know, I, I think some of that, I don't even remember anymore what, who did what, but I do think there was a lot of changes to that. I mean, that was something I pushed pretty hard for, but I never expected it to work like, I just wanted it to help explain where the characters were coming from. The fact that the movie, that people actually liked the ending, Sean was so worried about the ending. I mean, they did a lot of tweaks and stuff. We, you know, the first time I saw the movie with an audience and they really cared about Millie and Keys meeting up at the end, I was like, wow, sometimes things work out a lot better than you expect them to very, very rarely. Well, yeah, I was going to ask about that because it is interesting because it could have been this, this movie about, you know, you were like getting it's purple Rose of Cairo earlier and stuff like that in which, you know, Oh, we're in love together, but you're, you're kind of a living algorithm. I'm kind of a human being. So there's going to be these, these challenges, but having guy be this, you know, as I think the movie calls it a love letter, you know, sent to, you know, Millie. Yeah. That's the fine line I was mentioning, like when he pitched that, I was like, that's it. He is a love letter. And the author, that's the thing he wrote. The author is out there. And, you know, that kind of that was a great that was a great line. That was a great way to really simplify it, too. Yeah, it was it really helped. And it really helped even rewriting earlier stuff off of that, like a couple of lines, because that concept was so strong. But look, I think, you know, in terms of summing up the experience, I've been waiting. I think I've been waiting my whole life. I'm trying to think if I ever had another movie like this where everything comes out better than you expected and everything fits together better than you expected. And everyone's reaction is much more where they get every little thing that you were trying to do. You know, there's so many things that people praised about the movie. You know, it was very humbling. I was just like, I'm so used to complaining, you know, even on Ready Player One, plenty of people love the movie, but there's some stuff in there that very few people ever write about in terms of the Steven Spielberg, like demythologizing nostalgia and basically making a commentary on a film culture that he's been a big part of, you know, this kind of blockbuster film culture or any kind of culture that's really, you know, making being nerdy and geeky sure. a positive thing. And the movie, you know, the shining sequence is the best example where it's, it is making a commentary. Like this is someone Stephen worshiped who is one of his best friends and he's taking his movie and kind of messing it up on purpose, you know? So whatever, that was something that only a couple of people even noticed in this 
every little thing we wrote, you know, like the whole thing about, you know, God is an asshole, you know, is that what you're saying? And some of the other stuff, uh, we were just, I don't know. We were so thrilled by it, you know, that we, we actually thought the movie was not going to do well, you know, that because of COVID right. uh, two weeks before it opened, I was, you know, I was preparing myself for, you know, a movie that would, you know, I knew people would like it, but I didn't know it would do as well as it did. I mean, it was a blast. There were so many great lines. The line on gun violence was hilarious. The, 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 the throwaways, you know, the, when, when he tells the girl, you know, you don't have to live this life. You don't even have to stay with this guy, the bank robber's girlfriend, you know, and how she keeps coming back later. And, you know, the raise the hand guy. I mean, there were so many little elements that were funny as well, that there was just, there was a lot that resonated with it. I, I would have taken my kids, you know, had they both been vaccinated. So, you know, we had to watch it, you know, on, on digital, but I, I really enjoyed seeing it in a theater with other people because I was vaccinated and it was, it was a, the crowd reacted really strongly. The biggest point, of course, I'm sure you've answered a million times, but we, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up was you guys being true beneficiaries of that Fox Disney merger um, with the, you know, Captain America shield and the star Wars lightsabers and all the right music. Tell us, tell us how that scene grew because I, it was, it was just a fan favorite that, really no one was expecting and it just it was it was utterly hilarious i mean look i gotta give credit to ryan and sean i mean they you know obviously i'm sure i pitched at various points like various marvel things that you know i had gone through it on uh ready player one knowing that we had all the warner brothers stuff and a lot of steven stuff but we couldn't do anything from Star Wars or Marvel. So we were constantly brainstorming, like, as you know, that movie is just filled with stuff like that. But I mean, Sean and Ryan, and Ryan, you know, he calls up Chris Evans and Chris Evans agrees to do it. And that's what makes it more, everyone cheers, obviously the Captain America shield. But I would say for me personally, I would have felt it was okay. That's, that's nice. But you know, of course he has Captain America shield. Right. Seeing right. Chris Evans say what the shit right. made it like to me made it. And that all was after the fact stuff. I mean, that was all, I'd love to take credit for all of it. You know, I certainly would have pitched. I think I pitched, you know, uh, I forget what game it's from, but like the gravity gun thing that he uses to throw dude around. Right. Um, you know, that's what's left. Ironically, I'm sure everyone thinks, oh, I'm the Marvel person. Maybe Sean called me about, you know, something, but they I had nothing to do with it. They didn't need my help to suggest Captain America's shield. So well, let's let's talk about let's talk about the the dude, you know, real guy 2.0. That yeah. was that was a funny physicalization of an antagonist. And of course, he has his own awakening. To tell us about kind of scripting that, because it's you know, it's a bump, right? We know that real guy 2.0 isn't really going to stop him. So it's, yeah. it's another great comedic setup. It's another great action setup, but what, what did it mean to you from, from when you were toying? Well, dude predated me. That was right. Ryan, Matt and Sean, uh, the whole idea of it, the stuff that I added to it was, and it's, you know, my friends laugh at me about it. I'm constantly writing TBD uh, or funny thing here, stuff like that. And I would do it you know, it's a really good example. And I haven't really talked about this before, but Sean, we were under such pressure and, you know, I was writing something in one side of the room while Sean was looking at other stuff. And I would just say, trust me, you know, I just write funny thing here. And Sean would be like, I totally get it. You know? And sometimes he'd be like, we really have to figure out what that funny thing is. And I'd be like, we'll do it later. And one of the things was what should dudes catchphrase be? And I think the first line I wrote was about, you know, TBD, next thing here, you know, whatever. And then I just said, why don't we just, what if we just use all the kind of stupid shorthand that I use? Because it made perfect sense. Antoine is much lazier than me. And he just, you know, right. put all of it in TBD. And that is a total bit of screenwriting you know, insider stuff where you just use. Right. Yourself. Cause it's, it's placeholder. And, and they were launching that, that new version so fast that 
the techs were saying it wasn't totally done. And it was yeah. just hilarious. It I was mean, a, that, that was a great it, moment. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I was really excited when I wrote that line out. I mean, even catchphrase, I love, you know, right. Tycho improvised that catchphrase is catchphrase is a pretty good catchphrase, you know, like he does his own, but you know, that idea and where'd you get that skin certain things that again, they just worked out really well. And a lot of them, you know, the whole catchphrase thing, you know, Sean and Ryan totally embraced it and started riffing their own jokes off of it. And that's what you want. Like that's the collaboration you're looking for in a movie. You know, that that's the dream that you have is as a writer, not that they put exactly what you want on screen. It's that you write something and other people make it even better, you know, and it sure. seems possible. I mean, a lot of times it is very hard if the script doesn't have it, the movie's not going to have it, but this is not one of those cases. You know, editing is the last stage of storytelling. What were, what were some of the things that you noticed needing to be moved around or lost in the last stage of editing? Some of the deleted scenes that might be on the Blu-ray. I don't, I'm trying to think what got lost. I, I told Sean that when he showed me the rough cut, I went to see the rough cut. For me, almost every time I see a rough cut of a movie, I hate it. If it's something I've worked on. Right. And, and I've learned, you know, I tell my wife, like, just remind me if I come home and say, I hate it, you know, you'll, I don't need someone to remind me. And the only other movie that I remember the first cut of it, I mean, Ready Player One is different because Steven edits his movie and then shows you what's not really a rough cut. Like he's really gone through it with a, a whole, you know, his whole uh, editing team. So it's pretty polished when you see it. The only movie I ever worked on when I saw the rough cut, I was like, wow, that was really funny. My wife and I watched it on VH. She was my girlfriend at the time. And that was Men in Black. And when I saw the rough cut of this, I told Sean, like, wow, that was really good. And he was like, but seriously, I'm like, it was really good. It was really funny. I can't believe I didn't hate it. I actually liked it. I kind of want to watch it again. And I told him the only other time I felt that way was on Men in Black. And, you know, even some of the better movies I've worked on, you know, um, I mean, I saw a cut of Avengers that was not so great, in my opinion. It was really, it was very clunky. Uh, but I mean, rough cuts are clunky. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it shouldn't freak people out. Yeah. And that wasn't even a rough cut, but that's a different story. Um, gotcha. But, but, you know, in this, from the first cut, you just saw it was working. And frankly, it was more adding stuff and changing the ending. That's mostly, we start to realize like people care more about these characters than we expected them to. And we didn't have to, we could go a little bit further than we did. You know, well, tell, us about always, it. tell, tell us how the ending changed and, and, and what you were doing. Cause I'm guessing you were in post obviously during the pandemic. And so things were shut down, your film was delayed. And so you had more time for polishing what were some of the changes that happened there? Well, I think we were in post before the pandemic. Okay, I mean, that's okay. how long ago we did it. I was because I remember, I remember them shooting some the ending on the Paramount lot. And it was an example of where, you know, after Sean had showed the cut a bunch of times, people loved Buddy. They loved Dude. They, I mean, they loved, you know, they had something good to say about everything. So we felt like, well, maybe we shouldn't have such an abbreviated ending. I mean, it was just much shorter and it didn't push as hard on million keys because it felt like who, I don't know, when we were writing and we we're like, are people really going to care that much about what happens when people watched it? They're like, hell yeah, we care. And so, you know, I mean, I, I actually think we had a version of that always, but like it just got bigger and more emotional. Um, well, how long would so, you say those reshoots were? Uh, it's just days, just days. Okay. Of days. And so were you basically doing um, not, active- they weren't reshoots. It was additional shooting. Was additional like shooting. Were you were you thinking of connecting the, the the tissue between the characters and just giving it a little more time? Was that was that the goal? No, the stuff that was in the additional shoot that I went to was all stuff at the end with Guy, Buddy, and and Dude. Okay. Like literally at the very end, you know, it was just the audience cares. So we have license to tie, you know. You're always thinking like, let's not overstay our welcome. But if the people, if people care about the characters 
you they kind of want to see what the last you know where they're going next sure. where sometimes you're just like will they care about i mean i was really into the, the bombshell uh joke was something that you know i had pitched my daughter who's now in college you know and i just thought she would get a kick out of it and you know it suddenly people really liked it you know um so we could do more of it you know um i don't know that we did that much more but we could have i guess right um, but yeah i mean i'm sorry to be vague i just it's okay to be vague I, that's one of the problems of having a really charmed experience there's less because there's less conflict there's less to remember you know you really remember the things you fight over which is i'm so used to like um talking to people about movies i've worked on you know any number i mean x-men the last stand is the one i most often argue with people who who say it's the worst movie they've ever seen. And I just say, okay, I'm going to walk through this scene by scene. You tell me which scenes were bad. And you go through the first 25 scenes in the movie. And they're like, that was okay. All that was good. I just didn't like the ending. It's like, okay, that's a little bit different than the worst movie you ever saw. You know, you remember all that stuff. If it's all working well, that's why it's very hard for me to remember who wrote what or who did what. You know, yeah, and, I mean, uh, and it's good to have that experience. It's so great that you had, you know, Free Guy and Ready Player One back to back because they were both two career highlights for you. you I, know, I guess one thing that we talked about earlier, just that I wanted to ask again, you know, now that we're in the spoiler section, obviously, having you know, this is a great comedy. I mean, the laughs are there, some of the video game references, you know, ranging from Fortnite to even obscure games. We're just all over the place. What kind of work did you do with round tables and stuff like that? And what could you tell us about that experience if there was? There was no round tables. No the round, round tables. Table, first of all, Ryan Reynolds counts as like four people at a round yeah, table. Yeah, well, of course. You know? um, and between he's, he's always Ryan, the secret weapon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he just is. He's just really good at coming up with ideas. And, you know, he's, you know, obviously got we both share a love of kind of absurdist, dark, verbal humor. So, like, you know, I found it as soon as I started writing for this character, that's like the third day. Once I realized, I, I don't know, I sent some pages. And once Ryan was like, I love this, you know, Sean told me or Ryan told me that he loved it and was riffing off of it. I was like, this is a blast. Cause I kind of can hear his voice in my head. Cause it's pretty similar, you know, like, you know, the joke that guy tells, you know, when he says, oh, I know a joke, like Ryan really embraced, I thought everyone was gonna be like, that's really tasteless, which it isn't. It's just the beginning of a tasteless joke. But anyway, I, it, you know, there was no round tables, you know, Sean got a lot of opinions. He always does on the cuts. He also, I'm sure sends the scripts to various people, you know, he's always getting people's opinions, which is smart, but we never had to go into any of that because, it was just working. So yeah. Well, I mean, it's great the way that you changed the ending as well. I mean, is there anything else you want to tell us about the original ending just so people could see? No, it, it wasn't. I want to, it was not that different. It okay. was just more, it but was, it was more a refocus that, with keys was definitely something that was new. Well, no, that was new from when I rewrote it. Right. But like, That's what I mean. That was, yeah. So that was in, you know, that was in the cut. Oh, wait, are you talking about the rewrite or the rewrite? I'm just talking about the ending in general. So, I mean, oh, you... well, yeah, the ending took us a while to figure out. I mean, it was always going to be something involving those, you know, what happened. But uh, it's just more like, you know, you want to end on a bang. You know, we had talked about doing a final shot of Guy that was just insane. You know, like something I wanted to do in Ready Player One was like, a car on the back of a dragon that's on the back of a spaceship, you know, or something. And, right. you know, I just wanted to do that. They're all like firing weapons off into the air, which did not go over well. Um, and we were talking about that for free guy. And then we were like, maybe we should focus on these characters. And we did. And the more we went into it, the more it felt like, yeah, that's all. We just have to keep fleshing this out. And, and, not assume that people are bored because it turns out they weren't. Um, but well, yeah, I don't want to bore people either. So we're going to wrap this up in a couple yes. of minutes, but I want to talk about what you're working on next. So, I mean, obviously one question that everybody has for you is 
what's going on with Rom? It's kind of been announced. It's kind of on hold. Where where is Rom right now? Is there anything interesting to tell us? I don't know where Rom is. Uh, he hasn't called or did, written. Did you complete a screenplay of Rom? I completed a screenplay of Rom. I don't know. Maybe it was four years ago or three okay. years. I don't even remember. Uh, and I really have had no contact with any of the people involved. And there's been a lot of uh, chairs, you know, chairs being shuffled. Um, okay. You know, a lot of so I have no news for people about Rom. Uh, other you- than I still think it's a good idea. What could you tell us about Beacon 23, your TV show? I, it's based on a novel. Yeah, it's based on a Hugh Howey novel. Hugh's having a very good year. His other uh, novel, Wool, which is a series of novels, uh, is also getting made right now. Um, so it's a great year for him. Uh, I'm very excited about it. It's um, Lena Headey and Stefan James. It's very different kind of a science fiction show that's much more about the relationship between two people. It's almost like, uh, like a stage play that I would have written when I was young, you know, when I was in college. You mean like Solaris in a sense? Yep. It's got some, it's, it's a little bit more of a thriller, you know, I mean, not the, you know, Tarkovsky or Soderbergh are not exactly known for their thrill a minute, you know, that's not their focus. Uh, I I think there's not much to say other than we're going into production in January and we're building the beacon right now, which is going to be pretty cool. And who's Uh, it for? It's for Spectrum and AMC. Oh, okay. And they actually ordered two seasons. They decided to order two seasons up front instead of one, which is great news, incredible news, but also a lot of work for me. Um, Without giving too much away, does that mean that you were able to split up the entire book over two seasons? Oh, no, no, the book, even Hugh and I, Hugh is involved in the reconception of the series. The book is just five stories that are about this guy on this beacon. And we couldn't have stopped there. Uh, So we kind of moved, you know, Hugh and I together moved past some of the things that are in the book. Um, But then, you know, they just really liked how it was coming along in the cast that we got. And they just said, you know what, if we're going to build this set, let's do two seasons of it. So, so are you going to shoot two seasons back to back? Yeah. Wow. But they're each, they're each eight episode seasons. Yeah. And still it's a lot. I mean, 16 episodes of this show is going to be a lot. Sure. Um, but you don't say no when you're given that opportunity. No, that's so great. I'm very excited about that. And also I've been working with um, Sean and Ryan and Matt Lieberman on the sequel to Free Guy. That so. I was that was going to be my next question because it it was it was not just a box office success; it was also a critical success. And so everybody had been waiting to hear an announcement on the sequel. Where are you guys on it? We're, I mean, are you going? We're into very script much. Stage? We're very no. We're not in the script stage yet, but we are in the initial stages of, you know. Uh, I think Ryan has said this already, but we're, you know, we think we have a good concept for where to go uh, for the sequel and some things to do that would be very unexpected. Um, And it's been really fun working. You know, it's interesting to be like, we all agreed to come up with the story for the sequel together, which is great to have Matt Lieberman and to have Ryan and Sean. And, you know, it's just, that's, that's full circle then for Matt. Because you it replaced is. him and now he's back and collaborating with the team. And that's, yeah. that's cool. Yep. I mean, we, you know, and also, you know, a lot of the times it's, do you get along with, and do you agree with the original writer? You know, do you have the same sense of humor and the same storytelling sense? And it's been great having Matt because I, we get along really well and we agree about almost, you know, most stuff. Um, so but mostly we're just all kind of, you know, there's a lot of different scheduling things. You know, obviously everybody is really busy and Sean is off doing something and Ryan's off doing four things and Sean's doing four other things. Um, and Matt and I are both busy too, but we did, I do think we're, we're getting to a point where we are going to be ready to, you know, really seriously start working on what the sequel is going to be, you know, that's writing great. a script. I don't know why I'm dancing around the idea that I'll be writing a script, but I will be eventually. Um, but 
I think it was all propelled by, it was such a positive experience. You know, it was already a positive experience, but then the release of the movie was such a positive experience for everyone that there was this phone call. We're all like, you know, we should just appreciate this. Like, this is amazing. You know, all of us were like, let's not, let's not, you know, and it's something I've learned in my career. Let's not lose this moment, you know, particularly before the movie comes out is a good time to really appreciate it. But in this case, it was like after the movie came out, like this is good for movie theaters, which is important to all of us. And it's, it's been such a blessing, you know, to the experience of the reaction to it. So let's not stop, but let's go forward in that same spirit, you know? So yeah. Guy, Guy has inspired all of us. Um, even it, it was it was a fantastic theatrical experience. Hopefully, damn it, by the time the sequel comes out, we could do an in theater screening and Q and A together. Um, well, but look, good. you have been as always very generous with your time. I, I can't wait to see what Beacon Twenty Three turns out to be. So I'm I'm very excited for that. Uh, thanks again for for chatting about Free Guy today, Zach. Thanks, Jeff. It's all I know. I'm always going to have an interesting conversation when you call. So thanks, um, man. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to co-writer Zach Penn for being so generous with his time and chatting about his latest film, Free Guy. And folks, I hope you also check out our sponsor today, Coverfly, over at Coverfly.com. They are an absolutely great resource for connecting screenwriters to industry professionals. And hundreds of writers have already met their agents and managers through Coverfly.com and have gone on to work for companies like Universal, Netflix, CBS, Amazon, and Blumhouse. So if you're an emerging writer with a finished screenplay, make sure to check out Coverfly.com to see what resources they have that are right for you. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine. We just published our new issue, the Dune issue, issue 45, and I am so proud of it. There are so many great things to check out in there, and I hope you take a look. You could see our table of contents over at Backstory.net. And, uh, you know, it's the holiday season. If you want to give a gift of Backstory, just check that gift box at checkout at Backstory.net, and you will be able to gift a subscription to the storyteller in your life. If you've never read us before and you want to check out our free issue, you can read it at Backstory.net or via our iPad app, Backstory. And if you like what you see, just to sweeten the deal, I am happy to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page which is where all these interviews go that are Zooms, support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to get a hold of me, you could always track me down by finding me on Twitter as Yo Goldsmith or running the Backstory underscore Mag account on Twitter. It's those same two accounts on Instagram, Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag. And uh, I have a Facebook fan page I check sometimes. You could also write me a letter at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. I promise not to respond immediately, but I will get back to you. It just takes a little time sometimes. But don't worry, I will get back to you if you write an email. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A. Thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.